Anyway, <laughs> tonight we're going to talk about um, one aspect of foot pain. Foot pain, there's virtually an epidemic of it. Certainly, if you get a reputation for treating foot pain, you'll do nothing else all day. And it's a particularly rewarding aspect of the job. So is a, is a is a specialty of many, many subspecialties. So I guess no one really knows for sure how much foot pain there is. Uh, certainly, the, the biggest or the best insight, I think, came from the work of Hilton Prince, the Australian podiatrist, who reviewed 55,000 GP consults in Staffordshire. And he found that 8% of all those GP consults were accounted for by foot and ankle pain. Just as interesting, between 1 and 11 consultations was given to every patient who had foot pain. So, you know, seeing a GP, well, obviously, clearly this was pre-pandemic, but seeing a GP up to 11 times with a painful foot and ankle is a real, suggests, doesn't it, that either the, the, the diagnosis wasn't in any way forthcoming or the treatment just wasn't working and the patient just kept going back, a repeat offender or repeat, repeat attender. So tonight we're going to look at just one specific cause of foot pain, and that's heel pain. Uh, this in itself, once upon a time, I just reviewed all the referrals I was getting with foot pain and 6% of all my referrals, surgery cases, the whole lot, was accounted for by heel pain, but it felt like 666%. Certainly, when I did that small audit, I then would use those figures to set up an MSK clinic. I think it was one of the first in the UK, in Newcastle and Nottingham. And uh, at the same time, Sheffield did something very similar, and they were quickly overwhelmed by heel pain, so much so that they started to call the patients to meetings where they were essentially given a lecture on their heel pain. And there'd be 20, 30 patients there being explained to and what steps and measures they could take themselves to help themselves. I've got real big ambitions for our profession, and certainly, you know, lots and lots of people treat heel pain but I wonder if we can treat it better than everyone else. All heel pain should, I think, go to podiatric medicine. That's the term, by the way, that's championed by Martin McGill. Move from podiatry to podiatric medicine. I think he's got it absolutely right. We should be doing that. Can we, as a profession, as a specialty, take a better history than everyone else? Can we examine it better? And can we provide a range of better treatments than everyone else? Well, the first step in doing that is your assessment of the patient. We need to establish a diagnosis. We then need to grade the severity, determine the appropriate level of treatment, and allow yourself as a clinician to determine the response to treatment. And with that, you can then determine a prognosis for the patient. So what are the signs of this? Where do we start? We start with this. Um, patients who've got plantar heel pain, you can, you can die. My good friend, my late friend, actually, Lyndon Jones, who was a podiatric surgeon in Salisbury, reckoned that he could diagnose the patient from picking them up in the waiting room and walking with them to his consultant room. Now, that's pretty good, I figure, but heel pain is one of those complaints that you probably can do that with because patients who've got it, when you call them from the waiting room, they stand up in a certain way. They stand up guarding their foot, their heel. They then wince as they take the first few steps because it's agony. And that's called startup pain. It's a fairly specific finding, not a very sensitive one, though, because there's other conditions that can cause startup pain. The Americans, by the way, cause it, call it post static dyskinesia. So after rest, can't walk. It's a feature of any inflammatory condition affecting the foot. On your way from the waiting room to the consulting room, you might ask the patients, when's your pain worse? A feature of this is it's worse first thing in the morning or after they've sat or driven for a long period of time later in the day. Same old thing, first few steps are agony. But after a few steps, they feel they get going. They feel they limber up and everything loosens up a bit and they can start moving. The pain with heel pain is usually always there to a lesser or greater extent, sometimes even off weight bearing. The patients will complain of a gnawing sensation in their heel, which is hard to forget about. And that pain then starts to cause significant anxiety. The patients say things like, if I can't walk because of this pain in my heel, well, what am I here for? 
the history. Many patients with this condition are overweight because this is an injury. It's an overuse injury. And likewise, if they're not overweight, they have a history of overuse, too much exercise, too much repetitive exercise. Rarely, though, is there a specific injury that starts this off. Usually it's just something that emerges. Though there can be some events that kind of start the thing off, such as the so-called beach break foot. People get a hotel a little way away from the beach and they walk every morning back from the beach every night wearing flip-flops. And that walk and very, very flat sold flip-flops can start this whole thing, the ball rolling. The condition can be bilateral. And I think when it is, the prognosis is worse, not least because the patients have got no way, no way of guarding the condition. So when we finally get the patient into the consultant room, we then start taking the history from them. And, you know, it never ceases to amazing how many patients come along to see me. And I'm not inexpensive. And it just, I get a masochistic thrill out of it. When I ask the patients, what can I do for you? And clearly they have given no thought whatsoever as to how they're going to structure a response to that question. Now, that's up to us, really. It's down to us. We then have to give them the vocabulary to tell us about what their condition is. And that means managing them, managing their responses by asking them very close questions. So the first question, clearly, is where is the pain? Can you point? Can you point with one finger? While most will point to the undersurface of the heel and perhaps a little bit into the arch, there can also be a confusing variety of symptoms associated with this condition. They can also complain of pain on the forefoot. They can also complain of pain on the lateral border. So down this side of the foot, extending all the way down the lateral border. They can also complain of dorsal midfoot pain. These are largely secondary symptoms, but they can leave you really, really confused. But ask them specifically, where is the primary pain where's the first point of pain that you you suffered from where does it feel worse you then need to systematically establish the points of most tenderness this is in order to confirm the diagnosis we know they've got plantar heel pain by this point they've told us that they're in most pain when they get up first thing in the morning they've told us exactly where the pain is we now need to make a diagnosis within a diagnosis because not all heel pain is equal there's different locations for their pain. And we're just going to work through them now. And if, if anything, this is going to be really the main thrust of this whole presentation, how you clinically examine the foot to come to a diagnosis and you use that examination every time you see the patient, determine the response to treatment and also their prognosis. The first place we look at is here. This is referred to as the medial tuberosity of the calcaneus. So it's essentially where the plantar heel pain or plantar heel pad meets the arch of the foot. So you've got this very you know, robust looking skin, which is the weight bearing area, meeting this less robust skin because it's no longer weight bearing. So just where the fat pad of the heel meets the arch of the foot, the medial tuberosity area. Secondly, we're going to palpate. I'm going to show you a video of this in a second. We're going to palpate the medial calcaneal nerve area. So this is slightly dorsally and more medially, so it's kind of the medial wall of the calcaneus, and it's where the plantar skin meets the dorsal skin. We're then gonna palpate the central plantar calcaneal area, directly in the center of the calcaneus. Then we're gonna go to this area, the so-called horseshoe area. So it's the, it's the rim around the posterior aspects of the heel. Last place is the medial band of the plantar fascia, just here. So put that all together. We're now going to examine the heel. I'm just going to turn on the video. Hopefully you can see this. Medial calcaneal tuberosity, medial calcaneal nerve. Then going to go to the central plantar calcaneal area. And now we're going to palpate around the rim of the heel. So the posterior aspect of it. We're then going to palpate the medial band of the plantar fascia. Once we've completed that, we come round onto the dorsal aspect we palpate the calcaneo cuboid joint and also the lateral band of the plantar fascia. Okay, don't worry, I'm going to show that again. Repetition is what educational experience is all about. 
medial calcaneal nerve, central plantar calcaneal area, the horseshoe. So the rim around the edge of it. We then go to the medial band of the plantar fascia and then turn the foot round and go to the dorsal aspect of the calcaneocuboid joint and then the lateral band of the plantar fascia. Right. Now let's explain why people get pain in those areas. First of all, let's talk about the uh, medial tuberosity pain. This is essentially where the plantar fascia inserts into the plantar aspect of the calcaneus. When you're palpating for this, you're actually pushing plantar posteriorly. You're pushing back onto that insertion point. The rim, the, the horseshoe area around the edge of the heel is actually where the, the Achilles tendon merges with the plantar fascia. Now, every anat anatomical text shows the relationship of the Achilles to plantar fascia, much like this, then try to make out that they're two separate structures and they're far from it. They're consistent with each other. The Achilles tendon actually doesn't just insert there with that tiny little insertion that you can see here. The Achilles envelopes the entire heel, extends medially, centrally, and laterally around, and then becomes the plantar fascia. They're the same structure. And for good reason, the Achilles tendon, the calf muscle, and the plantar fascia, they're the so-called drivetrain structures. They lift you up and throw you forward with every step that you take. Also interesting, the back of the calcaneus has actually got an articular surface there. It's shiny, brilliant cartilage, and that's just to allow the Achilles tendon to glide in this area as well. So bearing that in mind then, that the Achilles becomes the plantar fascia, it's where really the fibers meet just in this rim around the edge of the heel that you can get a point of tenderness. Well, it's not a point, it's the whole posterior rim is tender. And patients will often point to that area as their area of discomfort, especially if they've got chronic complaint. Also, if you've managed to get rid of the pain from the classic site of plantar fascia, which is the medial tuberosity that we first of all palpate for. The other areas that we look for anatomically is the medial band of the plantar fascia. The plantar fascia has actually got three sections to it. It's got the medial band, the central band, and the lateral band. Now, some anatomical texts will show that quite diagrammatically. So almost as three separate bundles of tissue. It doesn't work like that. They're, they're really quite consistent, especially the medial and the central, really quite consistent with each other. There is something of a separation, though, for the lateral band of the plantar fascia, and this shows it quite well. So you get this separate slip. But in plantar fasciitis, the patients will often complain about tenderness along the medial band of the fascia just at this point here, and that can be palpated just by pressing in this area here. Finally, we've got the medial calcaneal nerve pain. So this is pain isolated to the medial wall of the calcaneus. And where that is, is where the flexor retinaculum and the abductor allusus catch the medial plantar nerve of the tibial nerve, so the medial plantar branch. Off that comes another branch, which is often referred to as Baxter's nerve. And you can get a compression here, you get a nerve compression here. The nerve gets compressed between the rectaculum and the muscle belly of abductor allusus. And patients then subsequently get gross tenderness just in this very, very discreet area. So back to the examination, medial calcaneal nerve, central plantar calcaneal area, then to that rim around the edge of the heel where the Achilles tendon meets with the plantar fascia, then to the medial band of the tuberosity. All the time you're checking the patient for what, how much pain they're in, and then we come onto the dorsum. We're going to look specifically at the dorsum in a minute. Now, what's the importance of this? Why bother with this? You know, you've already established that the patient's got pain on the undersurface of the heel. Why bother trying to get a diagnosis within a diagnosis? Well, the reason is, is this. It allows you to prognosticate much more efficiently. There's also subtle changes in where the emphasis of your treatment is according to where you're finding the pain on the patient's examination. So the medial tuberosity, 
That's the classic site of plantar fasciitis. This, I believe, certainly in my clinical experience, carries the best prognosis. So with this, you hit it with all the usual treatments, which we're going to go into some detail. But this responds well to the usual treatments for, for plantar fasciitis. If, however, you find that they don't have so much pain in the medial, medial tuberosity, they've got the majority of their pain is on the medial calcaneal nerve. This, I find, carries a much more unpredictable prognosis. And in my experience, it, you know, chuck everything at it, chuck all the usual stuff at it, but it seems to respond best to a cortisone injection directly into the site of most discrete, discrete pain. Medial band plantar fasciopathy. This doesn't do well with cortisone injections. This only really does well with stretching exercises and wearing a heeled shoe and orthoses. Central plantar calcaneal area. This seems to do best with a combination of strapping and orthoses and also weight loss. Horseshoe pain, so that pain around the edge of the heel, this does best with stretching and heel raises. It's a diffuse area of pain. It's far too diffuse to even consider a cortisone injection. So one last time with this video, medial tuberosity, medial calcaneal nerve area, central plantar calcaneal area, strapping and orthosis does best for that. Then to the edge, the perimeter, the horseshoe area does best with stretching exercises, as does the medial band of the plantar fascia. Okay, right. I think I've flogged that particular horse to death now. So we're going to move on now. Dorsolateral pain. So patients get dorsolateral pain associated with plantar heel pain when they've had it a long time, when they've had chronic plantar fasciitis. So the patients will describe pain along the lateral border of their foot. You then examine the foot and you'll find that the area of most discomfort is actually the calcaneocuboid joint. Though the patient points to the lateral band of the plantar surface of the heel, on examining that, you don't get much in the way of tenderness. You can't actually palpate tenderness. So what do we do with this then? What we do is simply press on the calcaneocuboid joint. We try to locate it with our thumb and you'll find it. The patient's got a problem there, it will be extremely tender. This, on the other hand, is the lateral band of the plantar fascia. And I find this probably the, the least rewarding of all the physical examinations for heel pain. It's difficult to ever palpate much in the way of discomfort on the lateral band. And I think it's probably down to the fact that lateral band is this separate slip of plantar fascia, but also there's massive fat pad covering this whole area. So just going back to that diagram, there's that central separate slip for the lateral band of the plantar fascia. Having said that, patients do complain of resistant recalcitrant pain in this area. It's just that you can't examine for it. So what's the significance for that? So dorsal calcaneal cuboid joint pain is a secondary symptom. It's a result of the patients guarding their medial plantar heel pain, throwing their weight laterally, trying to keep the weight off the plantar surface of the heel, and the next thing is that they upset their calcaneal cuboid joint. And for want of a better word, they create an irritable joint. They inflame the joint capsule. This does well with cortisone injections directly into the calcaneal cuboid joint. Lateral band pain, though, has a poor prognosis. Again, I think it only really responds to stretching and orthotic therapy. Uh, it's too diffuse. The area is too extensive for cortisone injections to work. Right, now we're gonna talk about understanding heel pain. What, how can we explain these symptoms? We've, we've talked about the anatomy. I hope we've flogged to death the, the examination of the foot, but how can we explain the patient's symptoms to them? Well, the best one of all, the easiest one of all is that first thing in the morning pain, or by startup pain. First thing in the morning pain, this is critical to understanding heel pain. Patients lie in bed at night and whatever, position you sleep in, whether it's on your front, your side, or on your back, your foot will go into aquinas. It will drop into plantar flexion. That then allows the plantar fascia to relax. And as it does so, it tightens. When you get up first thing in the morning, you walk on this tightened plantar fascia and you cause 
further micro tears within the fibers of the fascia, right? This is why the condition becomes a chronic complaint. Every single morning, you are re-injuring the plantar fascia, and that's why it won't go away. And that's why patients can have this condition for months and years. Startup pain, how do we explain that? Well, similarly, if you sit and rest or if, you, if you're driving, your foot goes into an equinus position, it plantar flexes. That again, takes the tension of the plantar fascia, allows it to relax and contract. And it's that contraction, which is so pathological. On top of that, when you're off weight bearing, the inflammation associated with this condition will gather. It collects in the soft tissue, not so much within the plantar fascia itself, but within the soft tissues around the plantar fascia, superficial to the fascia, actually. When you stand down on it, the first few steps, you're standing straight on this bag of inflamed tissue. As you walk on it, you dissipate that inflamed tissue, you dissipate the swelling away. So as you walk on it, it gets easier and easier. But the first few steps, you feel like you're 104 years of age. But after a few steps, everything sort of stretches out. You've now warmed up the plantar fascia. You've pushed away the inflammation within the soft tissues overlying it. And that's how you start to walk easier after this initial startup issue situation. Barefoot walking pain. I, yeah, I'm com increasingly convinced that certainly in, in Western civilizations where we rarely walk barefoot as far, apart from around the house, I'm increasingly convinced that our feet have evolved to wearing heels because we just don't seem to do well barefoot walking or wearing shoes with very, very flat soles. Barefoot walking causes enormous pain to people who've got this condition because it again stretches and tears the plantar fascia. You get tears, micro tears within the fibers of the fascia, and that's what causes the pain, especially if you do it after lying in bed all night. You know, people, you know, they, they, they intuitively think that if you've got heel pain or a foot pain, you should walk barefoot more. It's the worst thing you could do. It's the last thing you should do if you're suffering from heel pain. Training errors. I'm talking to you tonight from County Derry, um, up here in the Sperrin Mountains. No one knows I'm here. But uh, I see a lot of patients uh, from Donegal. And uh, certainly the Gaelic football players at Donegal are obsessed with getting up at the crack of dawn and running on the beaches of Donegal. And who could blame them? They're the most beautiful beaches. But they're all sand, soft sand. Now, there's two training areas there. First of all, Getting out of bed and going straight into exercise is a mistake. You're at your least flexible. And that inflexibility leaves you at risk of injury. Secondly, running on soft sand gives you a negative heel effect. It puts enormous traction on the plantar fascia. Your heel sinks into the sand and that stretches out both your Achilles tendon and the plantar fascia and it tears it. That is a training error. All then cause micro tears in the fascia. That causes inflammation, that leads the micro tears eventually are replaced with scar tissue. The scar tissue is even more inflexible than the plantar fascia was in the first place. And this is how you get into this vicious cycle. The other factors are compression of the fascia insertion, when it's compressed against bone. And this is a particular issue if you're very, if you're carrying a lot of weight or if you've got atrophy of the fat pad. This is uh, one of our local heroes. This is Skinner playing for our local Gaelic club. And uh, when I first moved here to County Derry, we let the word go out that we'd see uh, Gaelic football, football players for free on my local club. But nevertheless, you know, we end up with at least three Gaelic players in the uh, kitchen every night. That, by the way, is his shirt. You'll notice that he's sponsored by Foot Surgery Services. Achilles Flex Bright. Let's move on now to examining the foot and I'm going to move seamlessly into how we treat it because some of the examination and diagnostic issues also become a treatment in themselves. I couldn't practice without this. This is a stretch board and it's available from Algios or you can just type in into Amazon Physi Amo, uh, stretch board physio works, works spelt with an X. You'll find it. Absolutely fantastic for diagnosing 
inflexibility, tightness of the plantar fascia, tightness of the Achilles tendon and calf muscles. When you ask a patient to stand on this, if they've got tightness of their posterior calf muscle and Achilles tendon, they will find it very difficult to straighten their knees. And the reason is if you've got tight calves, you'll also have the tight hamstrings and you'll have tight iliopsoas. When patients stand on this, they'll feel the tightness, they'll feel the pulling in the back of their calves just here, the gastrocnemius muscle belly. They won't feel it on the plantar fascia. Plantar fascia is quite an inert area. You don't have a lot of stretch receptors within it, unlike Achilles tendon, the calf muscle. So the patients feel the stretch in the calf muscle, not in the plantar fascia. And that needs some explaining to the patient because sometimes, well, often, you know, this is the mainstay of treatment. You need to explain why, although you're feeling the stretch at the back of your calves, the stretch is actually happening within your plantar fascia. So what you do is you, you roll out your stretch board and you ask the patient to stand on this, set it at the first setting, 15 degrees, and see if they can stand straight and ask them, can you feel it pulling at the back of your calf? You then ask them to stand off it and you set it at the next setting up, which is 18 degrees, and see if they have increased uh, pulling there, pulling sensation. They might not have had too much pulling sensation on the first setting of 15 degrees, but if they can stand at 18 degrees with no pulling sensation whatsoever, and they can stand completely straight, they're probably fairly flexible, but you rarely see that in patients who've got plantar fasciitis. Also just check out their footwear. Are they still wearing flat shoes? Because you need a round on them for that. So the treatment ladder, where do we go from there? We've completed our examination. We've completed it with asking them to stand on the stretch board. Now we start talking treatment. First treatment, we start, it's like climbing a ladder. So we start the first rung of the ladder and work up. First thing you say to the patient, this will sound too simple to be true, but don't walk barefoot at any time. Always, always wear a minimum of 20 millimeters of a heel. The best thing you could wear will be Crocs. And the reason is, Crocs or fit flops, by the way, the reason is that Crocs have got just the right heel height. And that heel height is two fingers thickness. OK, that's what they could be looking for. Now, I'm sure like me, you dread getting into tedious discussions with patients about footwear choice. Moreover, it's just as tedious if you tell the patient a specific brand of shoe to get and they go and buy it and then they come back telling you they can't wear it. It's an agony for them to wear it for whatever reason. Crocs, the reason why I recommend those is that the compliance is good with them. Because they're open backed, likewise with the fit flop sandals, the patients can leave these beside the bed and they can slip straight into them. They've got just the right heel height, they're easy to comply with, and patients become addicted to them. Now, as simple as this sounds, if the patients will comply with this, if they'll wear these, won't, don't walk barefoot at all, especially when they get out of bed first thing in the morning. If they comply with that, they'll find that instantly that first thing in the morning pain, that startup pain, won't happen or happen to a lesser extent. Now that is progress because already you're stopping this chronic vicious circle of daily re-injury of the plantar fascia. Right, get that over and done with. Explain this will sound so simple to be true, but this will make an enormous impact if you avoid barefoot walking. Never walk barefoot again, I say to the patients. You're at, prone, you're at risk of this, you're prone to it. Always, always wear a shoe with two fingers thickness of the heel. I then also explained to them that this is a condition that requires multiple interventions. Not one thing is going to make them right. Not one thing is a panacea. We've got to chuck a load of things at it at the same time. And that's how we start to see progress. So the second thing is, is a pair of Stimflex insoles. That's what I usually give the patients as the first line of treatment. It doesn't take up too much room. It's low profile, it's soft, it's easy to fit into the shoe, it's easy to comply with. But most importantly, if they comply well with this, then you can move on to a custom made orthosis at a subsequent appointment. At this appointment, this first appointment, you also get from the patient a pre-treatment visual analog scale. So how bad is the pain out of 10? 
10 being the worst pain imaginable, 0 being no pain at all. I work in Belfast. I say to them, 10 is a gunshot wound. They seem to understand that. 0 is no pain at all. Critical, you get this. Now, the patients won't want to give you it. They'll evade the question. It's Again, this gives me a masochistic thrill. So I ask them the question. They then go into a complete tangent. I sit there stony-faced, and when they draw breath, I say, so how bad is the pain from one to 10? Off again they go. I sit there stony-faced when they draw breath. So how bad is the pain from one to 10? And eventually you'll torture them until it confess, until they confess. Get the pre-treatment vas. Absolutely critical to measuring the effectiveness or otherwise of your treatment. Also, very importantly, the patients forget how much pain they're in. Okay. So when they tell you, when they come in for their second or third appointment, second or third review, and they say they're no better, ask them again what their VAS scale is. And then remind them gently how it was nine when they first came to see you. Now they're telling you it's four. So yeah, it'd be nice if you were naught out of 10, but you are making progress. You need to sometimes encourage and reassure people. At this first appointment, I also discussed the patient's weight. It's such an important contributory factor. And I just say to them, I'm only going to raise this issue once, but uh, um, the way I do it is I say, could you be overweight? And then wait for their response. Are you carrying too much weight? How's your BMI? That sort of open question. But they have to admit to you, not the other way. You're not judging them. You're not accusing them of anything. They admit to you that they're overweight. And that's quite helpful to then launch into how this is an overuse injury and a significant contributory factor is weight gain because it just overworks the plantar fascia. Remember, these are the structures that lift you up and throw you forward with every step that you take. And if you're carrying two or three stone more than you should be, you're just going to overwork them. That then causes a, a strengthening, but a tightening. And that tightening is the cause of the pathology. If they do nothing else, though, and you've already shown them the stretch board as part of your examination, get them to stretch. Now, I think the stretch board is the best way of ensuring compliance. And the reason is, is that firstly, they have to buy it. So they physically bought into it. Secondly, it's physical presence around the area which reminds them to do the exercise, to do the stretching exercise. You know, most people you give exercises to, the only time they think of it is in bed at night when they think, oh no, that's another day gone, I haven't done any. By putting this in the kitchen and suggest this to them, put it in the kitchen and what I'd like you to do is to stand on it a little but very frequently. So 20 seconds up to 12 to 15 times a day. Also, advise them that it's not a difficult exercise because you get addicted to it. This causes you such improvement. In your you feel like everything's stretched out. You just feel much more flexible after just 20 seconds of standing on it. And that improvement in your flexibility, that feeling that everything's stretched, is something your patients get quite addicted to. But we can use that for their effect, effective treatment. So you can get this, as mentioned earlier, off Amazon. I said to a patient recently who turned out to be a private shop owner, that, oh, yeah, you can get them off Amazon really easily. She absolutely flew at me that I shouldn't be recommending Amazon. She was an independent shopkeeper, and I should be giving options, not Amazon. So I'm a bit cagey about doing that ever since. Also, the reason why I want them to buy into the stretch board is that it's the most consistent, effective, efficient way of performing stretching exercises. There's other ways of doing it. And when patients buy this, you'll find that helpful neighbors and relatives will tell them, you didn't need to buy that, you can just stand at the bottom of the stairs. Well, yes, you can, but none of them, the warm stretching exercises, the stair stretching exercises, nowhere near as consistent or efficient or easy to comply with as standing on a stretch board. You're using your own body weight to achieve the stretch. Moreover, it's the same angle each time. And I don't think that's achieved either with the wall stretching or with the stair stretching exercise. 
You finish your first consultation with an explanation that anything that reduces inflammation is going to help this. So an ice bottle, uh, tell them to put a drink in the freezer, a can or a bottle in the freezer for 40 minutes, take it out and roll their heel over it. They can use an anti-inflammatory gel as well. They can use a massage ball, but anything that tries to reduce inflammation will help this. You then organize to see the patient four weeks later. At the second appointment, you get the VAS, most important. You then check their compliance. You raise the subject of the heeled shoes and the stretching. Are they doing it? Did they get the stretch board? Can I now check you? You get the patient to stand on the stretch board and check their flexibility that way. Obviously, we want them to improve. We get the VAS score. Also, ask them to tell you in percentage terms how much better are things. 10, 20, 50, 70%. What would you reckon? Get that and write it down. If they're no better whatsoever, at this point, I then introduce a Dorsey Wage Night Splint. So these are less easy to comply with. Patients find this difficult to wear. So they put this on at bedtime. It's hot. It's a bit heavy. It's obviously a big passion killer, right? But you get them to put that on. And if they'll comply with it, great stuff. Okay. This will hold the foot. A constant and gentle 10 degrees dorsiflexion. If they wear it all night, that first thing in the morning pain will become a thing of the past, especially if they go out of this straight into a heel shoe. If still no better, that's when there's a role for cortisone injection. Now, this is a, an unguided injection, as you can see. And I always inject from the medial side of the calcaneus. That's a lot easier for the patients to tolerate. And I inject just at that point where the heel pad meets the arch of the foot, 40 milligrams of Depomedrone. Now, cortisone injections are not without risk. And certainly after this is done, I tell the patients to rest for a few days and certainly don't think of any vigorous exercise because one of the risks is that you can get a rupture of the plantar fascia. It tends to be associated with repeated injections it's much increased if you go and needle the fascia at the time of giving the injection. So they need to rest up after the injection. They also need to be warned as part of the injection therapy of other potential side effects. So while I'm drawing up the cortisone, I go through a litany of what can go wrong, specifically that they can get a flare of the pain. So you can make them feel worse for a few days, up to 10 days following the injection. And the reason for that is the cortisone can act like an irritant when it's first injected into the tissues. Now, I tend to with plantar fascia because I find it on the whole quite a resistant uh, condition to treatment. I tend to promise the patients that one injection may not be enough. You might need a series of three injections. And what we're hoping for is a cumulative effect. So the second injection builds on the first, the third injection builds on the second. And in that way, you get further and further improvement. But what's critical is that you emphasize to the patients that not one treatment is a panacea, and that includes cortisone. They've got to be doing all the other things, the stretching on the stretch board, the wearing of the heeled shoe, the wearing of the orthoses, do all that at the same time as receiving the cortisone injections. And that's the best hope of resolving the plantar heel pain problem. Well, if that doesn't work, what are the other options? Well, you could rush to give ultrasound guided injections. I can tell you that I've been giving unguided injections for 20 years. And I've subsequently in the last 15 years been given guided cortisone injections using ultrasound. And I cannot see any difference in the outcomes between the two. And the reason why I say that is if you haven't got the facility of ultrasound guidance, it doesn't stop you from giving cortisone injections. You know, if you've got a POM certificate and you've been on a course, you can give cortisone injections. And, you know, anyone treating foot pain should really have this as an option. It should be an option that either they give or they can refer to someone else easily to give. Now, you do learn a lot, though, from ultrasound guided injections. You learn a lot about the anatomy and what happens as you're giving the injection because it's very dynamic assessment of the foot. So just a couple of things I want to show you. I want to show you a video of an ultrasound guided injection, but I just want you to um, orientate you as to where we are. So this is the skin of the heel here. This is the plantar fascia, the fat, sorry, this is the fat pad, beg your pardon, that's the fat pad there. This 
is the plantar fascia. Now, what you should see is two clear tram lines, and they should be in the region of four millimeters apart. But if you follow the plantar fascia forward, you can see that it suddenly bulges in this area here. That is the classic features of plantar fasciitis. This hard white line, by the way, is the heel bone, is the calcaneus. And you can see the insertion of the plantar fascia here, but it doesn't just end there. It comes round and becomes the Achilles tendon. They're the same structure. They're consistent with each other. And that's how you pick, picked up and drive forward with every step that you take. So here's an injection. That's the point of the needle. This is the fluid going in underneath the plantar fascia. And you can see that the cortisone is rushing down the length of the plantar fascia. And it's actually compressing the swelling within the plantar fascia. Okay. There again. Uh, this time you might actually see some of the uh, cortisone coming out. Articulate. Okay. So ultrasound carotid injections. Patients seem to latch on to that. They seem to think it's superior, but there is no research, and certainly my clinical experience, I don't find it anyway more effective or less effective than giving unguided injections. Extracorporeal shockwave therapy definitely has a place in plantar fasciopathy and fasciitis, definitely. I don't use it, but I know a lot of people use it carefully, and some patients find it difficult to tolerate, but not all of them by any manner of means. Platelet-rich plasma injections, no evidence yet. Uh, it's very expensive treatment. It's a very expensive intervention. And, uh, you know, I guess that the people who are getting good results with PRP injections, ones that are using it a lot for a range of different conditions. You could also consider a mobilization of an air cast boot. And that's kind of my, my treatment of last resort to rest the area. But before doing that, you need to consider other possible causes, other potential risks or diagnoses of why this patient isn't getting better. Because for one of these causes, CRPS, immobilization of the patient is the wrong thing to do. If there's any possibility that of CRPS, you must keep them mobile. Right. So if you're not making much progress, it's time to review your diagnosis. Number one, consider why it's proving so resistant to treatment. And sadly, and it's frustrating for everyone, but the most common reason is the patient has still not addressed their high BMI. The fact they're carrying so much weight that it's giving rise to an overuse injury of the plantar fascia. Another cause of it is that they could have ruptured the plantar fascia. This is a cause of ongoing pain. Pain slightly different. That the pain tends to be somewhat in front, somewhat distal to the, the fat pad. It's not the classic site of the medial tuberosity. The best way of diagnosing a plantar fascia is get the patient to put their feet together in so-called prayer sign. And what you'll always see then is the normal fascia on the unruptured side. And you can see that prominent band, the medial band of the plantar fascia there. But here, there's no such band. Moreover, when you examine it, there's kind of an empty feeling where the medial band of the plantar fascia should be. Ultrasound does have its role because that can identify if there has been a, a fascia tear, but it's something that you can diagnose both with the history, the clinical examination, and looking for this sign, this so-called rupture on the prayer sign, as it's called. Uh, another reason why your treatment may fail is that there's fat pad atrophy. If there is wasting of the fat pad, the patient will constantly feel like they're walking on a big marble underneath their heel. And obviously that's going to cause continued pain in the area. CRPS, we've mentioned. If they get this far and they're not doing well, there is potentially a role for surgery. But I can tell you, I did surgery on plantar fasciitis quite frequently once in the late 1990s, but I've rarely done it since. I did one about two years ago. And before that, I should think it was at least 10 or 12 years before I did it a plantar fasciopathy, a plantar fascial release. But this is it anyway. Just for completeness, the plantar fascia has three bands that we mentioned earlier. The medial band is about 14 millimetres wide and about just under five millimetres thick. What you do with this is you simply slit the medial band of the plantar fascia. You divide it from its insertion. 
If it's divided, it can't tear anymore from its insertion and that will resolve the pain. And this is how you do it. First of all, you dorsiflex the hallux to put the medial band of the plantar fascia under the most tension. You then make a small nick at the side of the heel, okay? This is going to allow you to push a blunt instrument in to create a channel between the fat pad and the medial band of the plantar fascia. So it's a blunt Spencer Wells forceps. Create that channel. I can then remove that blunt instrument and introduce a blade. So this is a beaver blade. I then put tension on the plantar fascia by dorsiflexing the hallux and draw the blade back or over the medial band and it goes, it just snaps. A couple of sutures to close the, the incision and you ask the patient to start walking on this immediately. You don't want it to reattach. So the patient walks on this. Rare for you to do that with foot surgery, but that's the regime, the post-op regime following a plantar fasciotomy. In terms of outcomes for this, well, the plantar fascia is there for a reason. You go and divide it and the patient can get a secondary problem, a new problem. You can replace one thing with another. And what happens is it unlocks the calcaneal cuboid joint and the patients start to suffer from intractable dorsal midfoot pain. All you can do for it is uh, custom made orthoses and cortisone injections if they develop this. But this is such a problem. It happens quite frequently and it's so resistant to treatment. This is enough to stop me doing these plantar fasciotomies. But it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, that the fact that's such an important structure by, this, by dividing it, uh, as Lowell Scott Weil used to call it, the rape of the plantar fascia, there's going to be some consequences. Just about there. So in summary, management of heel pain is a treatment program. It's got multiple interventions, not one treatment as a panacea. Say to the patients, we've got to chuck a load of things out of this at the same time. That's how we get progress. Having said that, start simply, work up. Start with the advice on what it's all about, advice on heeled shoes at all times, and the stretching exercises, and provide a simple authority to begin with. Diagnosis and recording of the symptom levels, as well as the sites of pain, is vital. And you do that with every uh, consultation with the patient. You repeat that examination because the patient's symptoms can change. The levels of symptoms change, but also the sites of pain change. And as they change, you need to change your treatment program as well. Okay? Because, you, for example, you can't expect cortisone to work when they've got that posterior horseshoe pain. The pathophysiology explains the symptoms as well as their management. As we mentioned, depending on the sites of pain, it changes the prognosis and the emphasis. There's a subtle change in emphasis. Small, some, treat, some conditions require more stretching than they do any other form of treatment. And indeed, stretching is probably the only effective treatment for that medial, for that medial band plantar fasciopathy. These patients are more demanding and more rewarding than most because they're in high levels of pain. So when you start to see progress, they are very, very satisfied with the treatment that you're giving. Finish off some hard questions on heel pain. What is the principal symptoms of heel pain and why? Principal symptom is first thing in the morning pain. And the reason why it is, is that the patient's in bed all night, the foot slipped into Aquinas, the plantar fascia is tightened and contracted. They walk on it and the first few steps are agony because they cause micro tears within the fibers of the plantar fascia. Why does the plantar fascia tighten in the first place? Usually it's an overuse injury. The patient's carrying too much weight or putting excessive demands on the foot that causes the plantar fascia to, to strengthen but tighten at the same time. Why are heel shoes so important? Because they elevate the heel and they take the traction of the plantar fascia. That traction is what causes the tearing to occur. What is the most effective form of stretching exercises? I believe, and without doubt in my mind, that using a stretch board is the best way to achieve compliance and it's the best way to achieve the most consistent and efficient stretch. I believe that stretching is quite the crux of the management of the majority of heel pain but not in isolation. You've got to do the other things as well. Is the plantar fascia a tendon or a ligament? It's a ligament. It's a dense ligament. 
It doesn't have many stretch receptors in it. So when you ask the patient to stand on a stretch board, they don't feel the plantar fascia stretching, but they will feel their Achilles and their calf muscles. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Tim. That's fantastic. A um, couple of things that are just jumping to mind before we go to questions. Um, you know, obviously I saw this presentation before and, um, you know, that uh, enabled me to change how I approached my uh, patients. The first thing was the more accurate physical assessment. Um, that allowed me to diagnose a Baxter's nerve compression, which had been misdiagnosed by many people. And uh, I probably would have misdiagnosed it myself if I had not heard your presentation. And it was actually with a consultant physician and uh, he had been around the, the block, so to speak. And uh, he went and got a steroid injection into the Baxter's nerve and it cleared his heel pain that had been persistent for years. So that was a great uh, uh, find. A couple of other points before we get to the questions. The barefoot walking, running. Um, I think that's, you know, if you think about the concept N, N equals one, that's very true for the patient that has the plantar heel pain. Um, having said that, if you're strong, fit, and healthy, um, barefoot running and minimalistic footwear is probably absolutely fine. And uh, I think as podiatrists, we need to be careful to suddenly jump out and say barefoot running's wrong or minimalistic footwear's wrong. Always think if, you're, if your patient's fit, healthy, and strong, particularly in the posterior chain, um, they, uh, they, they, may, they may be able to run barefoot absolutely fine. Um, another little tip, Tim, that, that uh, I heard from a, a very good colleague of mine, uh, Sarah O'Connell, when you have the patient on the stretch board and you get them to stand obviously pretty straight and raise the arch of the foot, it really increases the discomfort of the stretch in the calf. And what she refers to uh, is that it's the, the calf is the bully muscle and it's the bully that causes that foot to flatten a little bit more. So of course, if you've got limited ankle joint dorsiflexion, compensation can occur at the mid-tarsal joint, and that will create a more pes valgus foot type. Um, so the patient understands then that, okay, I've got to involve stretching this bully calf muscle because it's a factor in what's happening in my foot and heel. So I think that's a good little tip. Stretch board, fantastic. Another tip I took from you was the no barefoot walking, so the use of Crocs. Um, a point to add to that is even during the night, if the person gets out to go to the bathroom, that's a game changer, so thank you for that. Um, the, the bit about weight loss, Tim, that's a difficult one for a lot of patients because for probably the best part of 50 years, people have been told by the food industry to, you know, eat their porridge in the morning and their cereal and get their pasta into them and all their carbs and to try and now get people to switch to something like a low carb higher protein diet's tricky but i think that there's a rule for us to sort of suggest that and if you're looking at metabolic disease and particularly stage two diabetes um there's a lot a, a lot of evidence now to say that low carb not no carb low carb um, higher protein really does um, affect patients' uh, weight. And I think it's a challenge for people because they're in a metabolic process of you know, eating what they consider to be healthy, but unfortunately, all the signals are telling their body store fat. Very difficult. And last thing I would add is things like Hoka footwear, which now have the sort of built-in rocker bottom concept to the shoe. And uh, Sukoni, Brooks, and others have copied it, and they're really good too. So that's a couple of little things I would add. Um, just jumping up, Tim, to some questions here. Um, there's one from Michael asking, what are your thoughts on the plantar calcaneal spur being the cause of the problem? Okay. Well, I was, I was going to talk about investigations um, first, but so I decided we didn't have enough time for that. But uh, I would say that... Um, Ultrasound examination has a role because you can see the thickening of the plantar fascia. MRI has a role because you see the thickening and you can establish there's edema within the plantar fascia for MRI. MRI is very good for anything that's wet. So inflammation, infection is very good for that. There is absolutely no place for x-rays 
I will go that far. And the reason is, is that if you were to take 100 people with entirely pain-free feet, you would find that 15 of them would have heel spurs. The big issue, though, for clinicians is that if a patient has been has undergone an x-ray for a heel pain and has been told they've got a heel spur, it's a diagnosis that is virtually impossible to take off them. And the patients will be convinced that the only way they're going to get better is by having the heel spur surgically removed. But this is a soft tissue problem. It's got nothing to do with bone. It's simply a, a soft tissue inflammation problem that is a consequence of poor flexibility, poor condition of the soft tissues. So um, I've heard from time to time suggestions that there will be a, a standard operating procedure that patients who turn up for a heel x-ray when they're suffering from heel pain should be turned away from the x-ray department. Certainly it was something that was raised in Nottingham. And I think that is that is a good idea. Um, just, just very quickly also, all these physical examinations, the patients think that they, or sorry, diagnostic investigations, not physical examinations, the patients think that diagnostic investigations are absolutely critical. They believe that, you know, you put in a penny, you pull out a plum and, you know, they'll have the diagnosis and everything will roll forward from them, for them from there. I can tell you that there's very little role really for further diagnostic investigations. What's in heel pain? What's critical is that you listen to the patient and then secondly, physically examine their foot. And I'll tell the patients this. Yes, I can get an MRI and it will tell us a lot of information that's, you know, of dubious relevance but of much more import is listening to what you have to say and examining your foot. That tells me a great deal more. And I'm so glad to have given this lecture tonight because I think physical examination of the foot, hands-on examination, is something that we seem to have lost our way with. And I think it started when we spent a lot of time looking at malalignments, rear foot to forefoot relationships, rear foot to leg relationships. We then began to see them as a diagnosis. They're not, they're a finding, a clinical finding. Diagnosis is based upon palpating the part and the painful areas of that part. And to that end, I think uh, something the Firefly ought to consider is further uh, uh, lectures on physical examinations of the forefoot, which is a diagnostic minefield, but it's again, the diagnosis is best done by physical examination and listening to the patient. Likewise, you can physically examination joint pain in all these areas and lastly, tendon pain as well. Maybe something for a future series. Okay. Tim, that would be fantastic. Um, and uh, it immediately makes me think of when I had the good fortune of watching you explain to a patient the ins and outs of a, a ductal hallux valgus. And um, that has altered high I assess uh, hallux abductor valgus and how I explain it to the patient. And yeah. recently I did a presentation in Glasgow University and in Edinburgh University. And I literally copied what you showed us or showed me to the students. And uh, it, it's really, it, it's fantastic. So I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll lock you in for a, another talk on that. Uh, um, yeah. There's a few other questions here, Tim. Uh, there's one here from Chris, and he asks, in terms of foot orthoses design features, what does Tim feel are the most effective designs? Now, maybe that's something I could answer. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say one thing very quickly. I think the most important aspect of design is ensuring that it will fit within the shoe and the patient will comply with it. Over to you, Marty. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got to design it with the footwear in mind. Um, I think the first thing I would say, Chris, is you've got to look at the foot type and, and you may use the foot posture index. And then what you've got to determine is, are you trying to create pronation moments of force or supination moments of force? And you can do that by um, creating rotations within the shell, or you can do it by having lateral flanges, medial flanges, lateral Kirby skives, medial Kirby skives. After that, you're adding things like um, deeper heel cup, wider shell that creates, heel lifts for sure, heel pads, horseshoe spur accommodations, plantar fascial grooves, the list goes on and on. So it comes back again to N equals one, based on your assessment, based on the foot type, based on the footwear, based on all of the factors. So I think that's one that 
you know, if you if you want more detail on that, I would just reach out to the Firefly technical support team with a, with a specific uh, patient in mind, and then they'll give you the the various options. Um, hopefully, that is helpful, Chris. A couple of other um, questions, Tim. Uh, this is from Michelle. How do you differentiate between uh, plantar fascia and abductor hallucis pain? Okay, oh, I'm on physical examination, so. Just going back to uh, the sharing, am I, am I sharing my? Not yet. Again, okay. Just going back to that. Uh, just going to share, okay. Okay, so to answer Michelle's question then. It's, it's all about the physical examination. And um, the plantar fascia pain is very much in this area here. So it's the medial band of the plantar fascia. When abductor elusis is involved, it tends to give rise to this medial calcaneal nerve pain, Baxter's nerve. So it's the branch coming off the tibial nerve that then supplies the plantar surface of the heel. And if you press directly in this area, that's where you get the most discomfort, okay? So it's just that, that physical examination is just looking for these discrete points. So it's a, it's an anatomical examination. Obviously, that's how you do it. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, there's another question um, from Adam. Hi, Tim. From a biomechanics viewpoint, what do you think contributes to each of the differential diagnoses you described earlier in the presentation? Apart uh, from the joint dorsiflexion? Okay, well, I think that's the key issue that uh, patients have lost their flexibility and uh, they've developed this overuse injury because they're overworking the plantar fascia. It's tightened, as has the Achilles tendon and the calf muscle. And, you know, you, you won't see a good flexible Achilles tendon or calf muscle and plantar fascia in patients who've got this condition. So it's principally their physical, a lot of pay, physical flexibility muscle and tendon flexibility is far more important than muscle strength and when you lose that flexibility that's when you're at risk of these injuries i hope that answers the question so mostly in the sagittal plane then yeah yeah okay there's another uh, question here from mikhail and it says rathlef loading protocol was not mentioned apologies if it has and i've missed it do you right. not recommend this for your plantar fasciosis patients uh, i don't know what it is <laughs> neither do. so maybe michael you're, you're gonna to have to enlighten us or we're gonna to have to go and google that for <laughs> right. uh, um, apologies um am i am i right to ask this question uh, it was well, the protocol that it um, involves a dorsiflexion of the toes with usually with a towel placed under the toes and uh, repeated uh, heel raises on the edge of a step Okay, so you're getting eccentric and concentric loading then because you're moving up and down on the step. Is that correct? That's correct. And there is a nice symmetric phase as well because Rathcliff uh, protocol uh, involves two seconds uh, a pause at the at the top of heel raise. So you got three seconds up, two second pause, three seconds down. And it, I think it's a widely recognized protocol. So uh, I'm, I'm a bit surprised you guys haven't heard of it. Um, it's a paper. You know, I know it, but not, to, not, not as that name, you know. So um, yeah. All oh, right. We, okay. So be, uh, so that's probably my own ignorance on that. But um, yeah, that that's very effective for um, for patients. Yeah, um, for not only just the plantar fascia, but also for Achilles tendinopathy as well. Um, okay. Well, listen. Thank you for that. Um, people can look that up as well in their own time if they want to learn more and. Uh, that's the beauty of this, where we can share things and, and learn and you know, help our patients. There's another question here. Um, I've heard that compression of the plantar fascia is more likely to be causative in older patients and that, the, in, that in this case, heel cushioning is recommended. What is your opinion? Um, well, older patients do tend to have some atrophy of the plantar heel fat pad. And they, in those cases, the pain tends to be localized to that central plantar calcaneal area. So you definitely cushioning of that is, is the way forward. Yeah, I think when the likes of Hoka footwork came out with maximum cushioning, you know, there's a yeah. lot of 
patients with, with PDP and that, that transitioned into those and just love them. Um, next question, what about coronal transverse pain? Well, I, I think that, you know, there is going to be a factor in that. If you take something like um, uh, adult acquired flat foot and, you know, the transverse plane deformity occurring in that with ligamentous uh, sort of attenuation rupture uh, and plantar heel pain, I, I, I do think there's a, a role in all of that, you know. Um, that's my take on it. But again, if you're looking at sort of the integrity of soft tissues, um, Tim, so when you start to see this attenuation of ligaments and ultimately reactive overloading on tendons, it's probably all tied up to what you're talking about as well. Yeah, um, I mean, there isn't one single foot type in a biomechanical sense that is associated with heel pain. You'll see a range of different types from, you know, it's quite a continuum yeah. from pes cavus to marked pes adult acquired flat foot pes planus. So, you know, certainly uh, I, I think I take into account all these areas of malalignment, but I feel the more important aspect of assessing the patient is this physical examination of these discrete points of pain. Yeah. Yeah, um, this day, next week, actually, Doug Ritchie is going to do a presentation where he really gets into the assessment of the ligaments and the ligamentous attenuation and rupture that leads to allo acquired flat foot. And again, like you, Tim, very much into the anatomy, very much into palpation, hands on, get in there and really assess it. Um, another question, yeah, there's two more, I think, or three more, and we'll call it a night. Uh, do you think the heel spur is just a manifestation of overloading traction on the fascia? That's from Phil. Yeah, uh, certainly that, uh, that would be one explanation of it. Uh, but uh, going back to what we mentioned earlier, it's, it's, a, it's a common, it's a frequent and insignificant clinical finding. And the pathology is not the heel spur, it's the changes within the plantar fascia. Okay, thank you. Uh, another little question from uh, Mika. Hello, what is your thoughts of strapping to help with heel pain? And do you have a strapping technique technique you recommend, Tim? Yeah, so this is a technique that was taught me by uh, Andy Horwood. Ever so simple, the patients can do this themselves. So you just have this strap that uh, you apply with the foot in slight plantar flexion. And essentially what you're trying to do is to take the tension of the plantar fascia so it's this crossover of the strapping around the back of the heel and then back onto the arch of the foot. Ever so simple, really quick to do. And you can repeat that as the strapping stretches out, you can repeat it a couple of times a day. And I think this has also got a role when you give a cortisone injection just to try and reduce again, the risk of rupture of the plantar fascia following the injection. Okay, and uh, maybe this last question then from Adam. Um, he asked a question earlier and he's now saying, absolutely. So would you say gait assessment is quite valuable? Question mark. Oh, yeah, certainly. Certainly. In all yeah. cases, you know, it's, it's part of it. And, and uh, <laughs> the, the most outstanding part of that gait assessment, though, is watching them wince with their first few steps, the so-called startup pain. Okay, great. Um, I think at this point, it's 20 past nine, we'll probably call it a night. Um, uh, thank you to everyone uh, making the effort to transition from uh, Teams and Microsoft and into Zoom. Sorry about that earlier. But uh, so we, we, we give you a little treasure trail to follow to get to the gold dust. And uh, I want to thank you, Tim, and thanks uh, to Connor for setting this all up. Tim, thank you very much. Really appreciate the uh, content and everything. And thanks to everyone. Okay. Cheers. Thanks very much. See you later. Bye-bye. Thanks a million, Tim. Okay. So it's just come up with the, are you sure you want to stop recording in the cloud? Yes. Yeah, you can hit yes.